Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany where I have new videos every week about books and the geeky mom lifestyle. In today's video, I am beginning a reading vlog for Midnight Sun by Stephanie Meyer. So some of you guys might know that I have been rereading the Twilight series and vlogging the experience, which has not been like a particularly positive experience. There are definitely some issues with racism and problematic representation of Native American people, including cultural appropriation. So I am not sure what to expect going into Midnight Sun. For those who don't know, this is the Twilight book told from Edward's perspective. And I do have to admit, I am curious to see what she does with this, especially so long after the original series came out. So I'm curious to see how this goes. Additionally, for those who are interested, I did pre-order Midnight Sun from a local black owned indie bookstore. So hopefully some of the proceeds from that are going to a positive place. And for my reread of the series, all but one of the books that I purchased were used copies. I think there's been a lot of money going to Stephanie Meyer and with some of the harmful representation that has come from the series and from the casting of the film. Check out the article down below if you guys want to see the joy of the racist casting of Twilight due to the author's intervention. Check that out there. Hi guys, before I get into the rest of the vlog, I wanted to invite you to join me in financially supporting the Quileute tribe. That is the Native American tribe that is discussed in the Twilight series. They do not receive any of the proceeds from it and there is a lot of cultural appropriation and harmful content in the series. And so especially if you like me are spending money purchasing a book like I did to buy Midnight Sun and also with the fact that I'm talking about the series, I think it's well worth considering a donation to the Quileute Tribe's Move to Higher Ground initiative. They are a coastal tribe, which means that coastal erosion and global warming are causing problems with flooding. This is particularly a problem with the tribal school where the children get their education. They are raising money to first be able to build a new school on higher ground where it's safe for the children to learn and then eventually move other major tribal buildings and housing as well. So knowing that I was spending money on Midnight Sun, knowing I was talking about the Twilight series, I made a significant donation to that and I would invite you guys to do the same. The link is down below and I think not only is it a good cause but also it's giving money back to the people who have been harmed by the series and who are not seeing any proceeds from it despite the way that their culture has been used and misappropriated. Okay, with that said, back to the vlog. I am curious to see what she does with this, and I will update you guys in a little bit once I have gotten into it. This is a beast of a book. It is over 600 pages long. So while I definitely think I can get it read in the weekend, I'm not sure if I can finish it all today. We'll see how it goes. As with my previous vlogs, I will be switching back and forth between audio and physical, and I will be tabbing this. Last thing before I start my actual reading, if you guys are interested in joining in, we are doing a live show discussing Midnight Sun on Friday, August 14th. The link to that is down below as well. It is gonna be at 5.30 p.m. PST, 8.30 p.m. EST. I will be joined by Ashley from Bookish Realm, Isabella from The Feminist Bookworm, Izzy from Happy For Now, and Michelle from Thor Wants Another Letter. Huge thanks to Michelle for joining us. She is an indigenous reviewer and content creator and is providing some Native American representation in our discussions of the Twilight series, which I greatly appreciate and I feel like is definitely important. So there's all the info. I'm going to start Midnight Sun and let you guys know what I think. So I just finished the first chapter of Midnight Sun. Wow, Edward is so melodramatic. Um, oh, <laughs> so melodramatic. I think like at the beginning, it was a little fun kind of like seeing his perspective, seeing Bella for the first time and realizing he can't hear her thoughts was kind of interesting. But then the whole thing where he like, glares at her in chemistry class because he smells her blood and is dreaming of like killing her and how he would kill all the students in the class. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. He's so like moody hipster boy, I don't know. Other thing that's kind of weird about this is in some of the ways that he's talking about Carlisle, which I'd heard other people say before and maybe there's more of it later in the book, um, but I see what they're saying is that he kind of seems to be comparing Carlisle to God, which is weird. It's definitely weird. I'm going to show you guys a few of my tabs. And there's just some, definitely some like disturbing stuff in here too in terms of, yeah, let me let me show you a few of my tabs. Uh, 
this is interesting, but I'm definitely not like into it. I kind of hate this because I feel like Rosalie deserves better than this description of her mulling over her own perfection, thinking about how she's flawless with a symmetrical perfect hourglass figure. Like Rosalie has more depth to her, I think, or should, based on what we get later in the books. Okay, we get Jasper imagining biting this young high school girl. It's creepy. We're gonna get a lot of this. I just, it's just, it's disturbing, especially because of the fact that biting them seems to be often a stand-in for sexuality. All right, so this is when he first smells her. She, she walks into chemistry class. Her scent hit me like a battering ram, like an exploding grenade. There was no image violent enough to encompass the force of what happened to me in that moment. And so then we get this like whole super disturbing section of him like trying not to kill her and how he'd have to kill the whole room of witnesses. Okay, here's the stuff with Carlisle. This was just really strange to me, the way that this, I don't, like, this was a choice. He compares himself like this dark monster to Carlisle. There was no resemblance between the two faces. They were bright day and blackest night. It has this whole thing of like, I'd hoped that my face had begun to reflect his to an extent in the last 70 odd years, that I'd embraced his choice and followed in his steps. There's a lot of like religiosity and like comparison to God, which is weird. Carlisle's kind eyes did not judge me. I knew he would forgive me for this horrible act because he loved me, because he thought I was better than I was. Again, like this all feels very rooted in like religion, but it's weird because Carlisle's a vampire and he's not God. And like, I don't know, that seems like a strange choice to make. So there's this whole thing of like, he's disgusted with himself for being tempted to kill her. But because Carlisle is being put in this godlike position, it feels like a comparison of like resisting temptation to sin, which is weird. Often this seems to be the comparison of like saying guys have this kind of experience where it's literally this level of for them to resist sleeping with girls. And this is where you get into like rape culture and victim blaming. And I feel like this is the kind of thing that can tie into that. I know there are some people who are going to say that I'm overthinking this, but given the background of the author, I don't know, like this is how it reads to me and I'm just kind of uncomfortable with it. And then here we have hating her, hating how she made me feel. Irritation I'd felt before was weak, but it too helped a little. I clung to any thoughts that distracted me from imagining what she would taste like. So again, this feels very much like these guys, I can't think of the word for them, so one of you guys is going to know it, but these guys who like hate women because they won't sleep with them and think that they somehow deserve it. Like, I don't know, that's like what this feels reminiscent of. I know that's not specifically what's on the page, but I, I like that's the vibe and I, I don't, I don't love it. All right, last one here. This I just thought was kind of creepy. There's this whole thing of his interaction with the like school secretary and she's constantly telling herself he's too young, he's too young for her. And he's kind of playing into it in like a manipulative way. And it's just creepy. This is how we're beginning. Uh, where are we going to go from here? We'll see. So far, I'm not feeling like this is much better. It's different, but I'm not like liking it. So I am about 115 pages in and I thought I would do an update. In general, I'll say Edward is just so angsty and so melodramatic. The way he falls for Bella, I feel like, I don't know. I think she tries to give us more information as to why it happens. Cause based on the Twilight series, it feels like, okay, what, just cause you can't read her mind and you can read everybody else's mind, which I think is still kind of a lot of it, but he sees her like being really kind to people, which is funny because I feel like being in Bella's head, she comes across as pretty selfish and like not the best person. So I don't know, it's interesting. I think from Edward's perspective, Emmett is becoming a new favorite character for me. He's so great and so funny and he just kind of like is what he is. Like you kind of get what you see. This book is so long though. And I mean, I guess I should have known it's following the events of Twilight, which we've already read, but there's just so much repetition and it drags stuff out so much. It's not the most exciting. But neither are the other books. The other books are too long as well. So why am I surprised? Edward is continuing to be creepy. He's controlling. He's jealous. We get a scene where he goes into her bedroom for the first time and is watching her sleep. Like, I, 
I still don't like him and still don't want them together. So this has not changed that for me so far. Okay. That said, let's go ahead and look at some of my tabs. So we get a really brief scene of Edward interacting with Tanya and the Alaska clan. I kind of wish we'd actually gotten more of that. That would have been more interesting than what we are getting, which is way more of this, basically his perspective on the same stuff we already knew. But here we have it again. Bella with her translucent skin. This I find a little irritating, this whole thing of talking about how everybody wants to protect her. She looks so delicate. And I feel like, you know, with a lot of the things we've been talking about lately and the way people rush to protect white women, <laughs> I know that's not her intention probably when she's writing it, but that's definitely how it feels. This like delicate, translucent skinned girl who everybody wants to protect. I'm like, okay, sure. And then, of course, he does things that normally humans will instinctively be warned off of by. And it says all the little markers and signs that were sufficient to scare off the rest of humanity did not seem to be working on her. Why did she not cringe away from me in terror? Surely she had seen enough of my darker side to realize the danger. And this is like an ongoing thing of he's like, you should know better. I'm too dangerous. Here we have jealousy of Mike Newton, which is just so ridiculous so much jealousy throughout the series then of course he saves her from the truck that would have killed her and tries to tell her no i was standing right next to you what are you talking about and this is her first inkling that something is a little different well not her first inkling but another inkling that something is a little different about the cullens this i thought was pretty interesting uh he realizes that charlie bella's dad has slightly shielded thoughts, not as silent as his daughter, but partially concealed. So it's interesting, this kind of explanation of why he can't hear her thoughts, that maybe there's some genetic component to it. More jealousy, and uh, it didn't matter that Tyler thought she was pretty, anyone would notice that. Which, it's just so wild to me, like she sees herself as super average, but then he's like, yeah, of course she's pretty. And then later he's like, why did I ever think she was average? She's so beautiful. And we have, as you probably remember from earlier in the series, Bella and her super clumsy self, Carlisle laughing at all the healed contusions on her x-ray. How many times did her mom drop her? <laughs> like, she's like disturbingly clumsy. I don't know how she survived being as clumsy as she is. And another thing that he likes about her, she was brave and didn't like to show weakness, possibly the most vulnerable creature I'd ever seen. And she didn't want to seem weak. So this is him like slowly piecing together um, who she is because he can't hear her thoughts, that she stands up for people and is kind. We get to chapter four and he he's thinking to himself, I'm like a stalker, an obsessed stalker, an obsessed vampire stalker. And I'm like, yes, that is exactly what you are, believe it or not. Here we have him thinking about kidnapping her, standing up to his family, telling Jasper, I won't allow you to hurt Isabella Swan. Um, he is super, super protective, which again, who's surprised? Nobody. And then this is the first time we find out what Alice saw. Alice saw that either he was going to kill her or she would be turned into a vampire. He is going to do his best to make neither of those things happen. There's a lot of just rehashing <laughs> the, the earlier series from a different perspective, which is, is what this is, I guess. And we have falling in love and this, you're going to get the angsty melodrama here, guys. You could see how easy it would be to fall into loving Bella. It would be exactly like falling, effortless. Not letting myself love her was the opposite of falling. It was pulling myself up a cliff face, hand over hand, the task as grueling as if I had no more than mortal strength. The vast majority of my thoughts revolved around her as though she was the center of my mind's gravity. All right. Yeah. I mean, we get angsty, angsty, angsty Edward. <laughs> and here's Bella being nice to Tara by inviting her to join their group. See, Bella's different. She's not like the other teenagers. She's actually a good person. At least that's what he thinks. Yeah, and here it is. All those things added up to the whole. Kind and self-effacing, unselfish and brave. She was good through and through, and no one seemed aware of that besides me. Um, which is funny because Bella has similar feelings about Edward. I don't think either of them are actually those things, but they seem to think it of each other. 
And then what's funny is he's annoyed at Mike saying that he's treating her like an acquisition with like crude fantasies and stuff. And like, you treat her kind of like an acquisition too, dude. Like you're pretty controlling. More anger and jealousy, outright rage, aching for some kind of physical outlet. This significant undeserving boy might not be the one Bella would say yes to, but I yearn to pulverize his skull with my fist. Like this is disturbing, right? I mean, you're, you're an immortal vampire and you have this kind of jealousy and desire to be violent towards anybody because of her. I, like, this is doing nothing to make me think that Edward is a good choice. My feelings are not changing, basically. Bella would have been so much better off not with him. And then we have the sad nerdy boy, Eric. This annoyed me in the early series, too, that like he was kind of seen as pitiful. And even Edward thinks that way. This pitiable boy did not irritate me as much as Mike Newton did. Like, you know, because he's got acne and wants to go to Comic-Con and Bella's nice to him. So he thinks that he has a chance with her. I, I, I hate this trope. More angsty Edward, guys. I could never be an average boy. How foolish I was to set myself up as a candidate for her affections. How could she ever care for someone who was, by default, the villain of the story? She was too good for a villain. This needs to be like hashtag angsty Edward. Okay, this I just thought was weird. He overdoes his hunting and like in one hunting trip gets a small grouping of elk and a black bear. Like how are, how, first of all, that is a lot of blood, a lot of blood. And you have a human sized body. That That's, the, why did she make it that much? And additionally, if this is how they're hunting, if they actually drink that much, how have they not like killed off all the wildlife in the area? That that seems excessive. Okay, so this is the first time that he goes to her house and he's like, I knew, I knew I was being irrational. He's like, well, what if there's spiders that could bite her inside? What if there's a gas leak inside her house? I have to check on her. Again, like red flags everywhere in terms of controlling behavior. I, yeah, you know, I, I heard somebody say they thought it was less creepy from his perspective, I completely disagree. I think it's still super creepy. And here we have where the title is coming from. My life was an unending, unchanging midnight. It must, by necessity, always be midnight for me. So how is it possible that the sun was rising now in the middle of my midnight? Hence, the midnight sun. <laughs> Last one for now. It would be more prudent for you not to be my friend staring into the melted chocolate depths of her eyes. I entirely lost my hold on light, but I'm tired of trying to stay away from you, Bella. The words felt like they'd burned their way out of my mouth. Hashtag angsty Edward needs to be a thing. I'm sure we're going to get lots more of it through this book. Uh, that leaves me on page 115, about to start chapter six. I will probably check back in in about another hundred pages. All right, so it is almost 4.30 on Saturday. I'm here with my next check-in. Uh, I am at like page 218 approximately, like just finished up a chapter. Honestly, this is a struggle to get through. It's just not that interesting. Um, like I already know everything that's gonna happen and I don't find Edward's head that interesting most of the time, so it, it's... It's kind of a drag for me. I feel like if you really, really like Edward a lot, which like Edward has never been my favorite in the first place, but if you really like Edward a lot, maybe you would really enjoy this. But honestly, I'm pretty bored. That said, <laughs> let's go ahead and go through my tabs. Okay, so we have Edward using his persuasion on Bella, which is, you know, kind of creepy, manipulative. Oh, right. And then she's drinking from a bottle and he decides to keep the cap from her bottle. And this shows up several times. Like he puts it next to his piano while he's playing the lullaby he's writing for her. He holds it in his pocket. I don't know whether to find it creepy or cute. It definitely straddles that line. <laughs> it's kind of weird. And we have more of Edward being pissy about Mike and jealous. What else is new? And him finding it interesting that Shelley Cope, again, the person who works in the school office, has her pulse quicken when she finds him attractive, which like 
Number one, I find it creepy that this is a repeated thing that she keeps bringing up in the story. Like, why do we have to continuously have this thing of this much older woman who finds him attractive? <sighs> um, that said, he's like, oh, maybe Bella's pulse is racing because she's attracted to me. That would be better than her being scared. Here we have that Bella is clearly not like other girls. Normal human girls wouldn't raise their faces to the drizzle that way. Normal human girls usually wore makeup, even here in this wet place. Bella never wore makeup, nor should she. The cosmetics industry made billions of dollars a year from women who were trying to attain skin like hers. Blah. <laughs> I just... This is so... I, I also hate this. Like, I, I don't know if it's a thing that I see as more common sometimes around certain types of men, but like this thing of wanting women not to wear makeup... I mean, women shouldn't have to wear makeup if they don't want to, but I'm just always kind of don't like it when it's guys who are like, oh yeah, don't wear makeup, eh, whatever. Here we get the backstory of Carlisle and Esme. And again, like, I don't know if this is kind of weird that she had like fallen in love with him when she was a human girl and then just was haunted by him the rest of her human years. I don't know. This whole like sort of faded maid approach is just really weird to me, especially in a YA story, just because I think it sets expectations that can be a problem. This I thought was interesting. We see some of the other things that the Cullens do because they don't sleep. We have Alice working on a fashion design project. Rosalie is into tuning up her BMW. Emma and Jasper are doing an elaborate chess game. Um, Esme is designing stuff. Interesting, this kind of seeing a little behind the scenes in terms of what else they do. Edward has this issue of having severe anxiety when it comes to Bella. He's constantly worried about her. And I think this is supposed to make us feel okay about his overprotective, controlling, stalkerish behavior, but it's still creepy. So here he is worrying about fires and earthquakes and tornadoes, burglaries and homicides, all the things that could go very, very wrong. And then of course we have Bella sleeping peacefully when he climbs into her bedroom window. In fact, he brought oil to grease the mechanism so that it moved more silently. And again, he's in here watching her sleep. We see this happen again. There's another one that you'll see later where he like goes and gets another blanket for her because he thinks she looks cold while she's sleeping. I mean, I think this is supposed to be sweet, but it's creepy and it's definitely crossing boundaries. She doesn't know he's there. It's really not okay. Angsty, jealous Edward. The agony and fury of my jealousy was every whit as powerful as it had been last week. I wanted so badly to race across the campus too fast for human eyes and snatch her up, to steal her away from the boy I hated so much in this moment I could have killed him for no reason but to enjoy it. So it's Mike again. Any boy, any boy who pays attention to her is a problem. And of course we have our Bella who is a fan of reading classics. This time it's Sense and Sensibility. I think one of the last books I was reading, it was Wuthering Heights. You know, not like other high school girls, guys. <sighs> okay, um, and then I left, knowing I would return while she was asleep, ignoring every ethical and moral argument against my behavior. But I certainly would not trespass on her privacy the way the peeping Tom would have. I was here for her protection. Not to leer at her, in the way Mike Newton now no doubt would, were he agile enough to move through the treetops. I would not treat her so crassly. No, but you're still being creepy. It's not okay. Oh, this I just thought was kind of disturbing. Uh, one thing that you see a lot of is this focus on whiteness throughout the entire series. And in this case, they have two vampires who are visiting. Edward is thinking about them and says, his hair was as fair as hers and almost as long. They were very similar, except for size, as he was nearly as tall as Emmett. A well-matched pair, I'd always thought. Which, like, it just kind of rubs me the wrong way, this idea that, oh, people are well-matched as a romantic pair because they look the same? Because people with fair hair should be together? Bella is in Port Angeles, and he is following her. Stalkerish behavior, which, you know, we're made to think is okay because he ends up saving her from a potential rapist, but still... He follows her to Port Angeles and is thinking, oh, maybe I'll coincidentally choose the same restaurant as her and her friends. Maybe I'll invite Alice to join me. So this is when he hears the mind of the potential rapist 
The other people I think are less the problem, but there's one person in particular who, where she was not his first victim. He tracks her down and saves her. And we have more hashtag angsty Edward. I was trying to be good enough for her. It was an impossible goal, but I couldn't bear the thought of giving up. Cause you know, she's perfect, clearly. We see this thing of the waitress who's into him. I indicated she should attend to Bella and then went back to tuning her out. She had a vulgar mind. Um, you know, I mean, Edward is like definitely the prude as, as we see, which is why like all these years, Bella is the first girl who he's caught his attention. And even then he's super weird about it. Okay. So here we have <laughs> like heavy handedly telling us that this is supposed to be a Hades and Persephone retelling. So if you were wondering, here it is, guys. Suddenly, as she ate, a strange comparison entered my head. For just a second, I saw Persephone, pomegranate in hand, like the cover, in case you were wondering, dooming herself to the underworld. Is that who I was? Hades himself, coveting springtime, stealing it, condemning it to endless night? I tried unsuccessfully to shake the impression. Okay, so yeah, we're very heavy handedly being like, hey, guys, it's a Hades and Persephone retelling, which is like hard to do and make it okay in YA. But you know, when Edward finds out that Jacob told her about them, that technically meant it broke the treaty. And so he's like, I suppose this meant I was now free to slaughter the small defenseless tribe on the coastline, were I so inclined. Ephraim and his pack of protectors were long dead. We'll see what they do with that in this book. And here we have, I mean, the Bella who he thinks is perfect. We have her admitting to having tricked Jacob by flirting into talking about these legends that he wasn't actually supposed to share with anybody. And he just thinks it's cute. And he's like, oh, I could imagine considering the attraction she seemed to hold for all things male, totally unconscious on her part, how overwhelming she would be when she tried to be attractive. Um, yeah, and like this was not cool of her to do, but he just thinks it's funny and laughs about it. Yet again, if you'd forgotten that he spends practically every night stalking her in her room, he says, I'll see you tomorrow, I said, knowing that I would see her much sooner than that. She wouldn't see me until tomorrow, though. Creepy. And again, we have angsty Edward. I thought of Bella and requited love. She couldn't love me the way I loved her. Such an overpowering, all-consuming, crushing love that would probably break her fragile body. But she felt strongly enough, strongly enough to subdue the instinctive fear, strongly enough to want to be with me. And being with her was the greatest happiness I had ever known. Okay, and then last thing is he goes back to Bella while she's sleeping and sees she's cold and takes a blanket and puts it on her. This is the thing, is all the stuff he's doing, I think we're supposed to think it's sweet and caring, but guys, he's in her room while she's sleeping without her consent. It's it's not OK. All right. I feel like this is going to be a very long vlog. I am tired of sitting here, so I'm going to go for a walk. Listen to the audiobook while I go. Um, I do actually need to pick up a couple of books at Barnes and Noble. So I'm going to head over there and listen to some more of the audiobook show you guys a couple of clips of what I pick up probably, and then I will update you again in about another 100 pages. That seems to be a good point. Like I said, this is going to be a long vlog, guys. It's like 650 pages long, um, but we're, we're making progress. We're 220 pages in, so not quite halfway, but we'll get there. <laughs> It is 8.40 at night. I am checking in with you again. I am about halfway through the book. Um, I will say the last 100 pages has been more interesting, or at least parts of it have been more interesting than the earlier part. Um, we got a little bit more on Edward's history with Carlisle. We also get more of him actually having conversations with Bella than we ever got in the Twilight series. And so it's all of the stuff that's like, oh, okay, you guys actually talked about things because <laughs> despite how long the books were, we never really saw that. Um, so we're seeing it here. I still think it's it's way too long. Um, we will go through my tabs, but uh, this 100 pages or so has not been terrible. It's still not 
great. It's not my favorite thing, but there have been a few sections that were interesting. Like the whole story about Edward's early life with Carlisle was pretty interesting, but that could have been like an extra short story. So I will show you my tabs. Before we do that, I thought I would share what I picked up, including this really cool bag. Um, I went to Barnes and Noble and I they, they no longer give you bags anymore. And then I saw this and was like, that's really cool. Once Upon a Times and Happy Endings, Plot Twists, Page Turners and Cliffhangers, Magical Lands and Faraway Places, Heroes and Heroines, Choose Your Own Adventures, Love Triangles, Tall Tales, and Legends. Um, I just thought this was like a really cool tote bag. Nice and sturdy so I can keep that in my purse. So um, I picked up three things at the bookstore today. One of two of which are for me. So uh, the thing that I grabbed that is not for me is for my son. This is the second book in the Magic Treehouse series, Night at Dawn. We have one chapter left in the first book and he's been liking these. I thought I would grab the next one. We're doing chapter books. And then for myself, I grabbed The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson. I read this last month. I'll link that up above if you guys want to see my wrap up where I talk about it, but I really, really liked this a lot. It's got a little bit of magic to it, but it's really more of a horror novel that's like Salem meets The Handmaid's Tale, and it was just great. I really liked it, so I wanted to get a copy of that. And then I went ahead and decided to get This Is My America by Kim Johnson. It's on my TBR for this month. I have an e-arc from NetGalley, but I've heard really good things about it, and decided, you know, we're just gonna... We're just gonna grab this. So that's my little Barnes and Noble book haul. Okay, with that said, let's go ahead and look at my tabs. <laughs> this, I just think is funny. We're getting a lot of this of him starting to be more attracted to Bella and noticing stuff. And what's hilarious though, is he talks about the mesmerizing shape of her collarbones. <laughs> Oh my gosh, and the subtle shape of her body. And he was grateful for the unbecoming sweater. Um, it's just funny. Like he mentions her collarbone, collarbones a few times. I'm like, really? Collarbones? Okay. So this I thought was kind of interesting and very much in line with Stephanie Meyer's view of femininity. But uh, Angela is one of Bella's friends and one that Edward actually thinks is a good person based on her thoughts. And of course, as any good person who's a woman should do, she takes care of her little brothers with a maternal pleasure, which like, yes, is sweet, but also it's just interesting that like, good women are maternal. That is, that is a repeated theme. Obviously there's nothing wrong with being maternal, but I just, you know. We have them slowly getting closer to each other sitting right next to each other with electricity humming between them and uh you know he touches her face they still haven't kissed each other but you know this i thought was cute how edward gets Emmett to help him um get ben to ask out angela that was that was cute this definitely made edward slightly more likable than previous things over and over and over again we have edward going to bella's house while she's sleeping not that she knows it i did not feel the usual guilt when i returned to bella's room that night though i knew i should but it felt like the correct course of action the only right thing to be doing i was there to burn my throat as much as possible i would train myself to ignore her scent it could be accomplished <sighs> you know, you could ask. So we have her clothes again. Today, she's wearing a turtleneck, which is not tight, but still fitted closely to her shape. And I missed the ugly sweater because it was safer. Oh boy, she's wearing a brown turtleneck, guys. <laughs> and it's not even tight. <laughs> and you're gonna tell me, Edward, like, <laughs> didn't give in to Bella wanting to like sleep with him this whole time. Come on now. Oh my gosh. Okay, so this is where we learn more about Bella. They're going doing this question thing and it's his day and he asks her all these questions. What are your favorite movies? What are your favorite books? Uh, her favorite movies are the Six Hour Pride and Prejudice with Colin Firth, Vertigo, and Monty Python and the Holy Grail. This is so funny to me is that like throughout this is not like a typical teenager, especially for today. Although to be fair, when I was her age, I liked Pride and Prejudice and I liked Monty Python, but 
I don't know. It's just it's just funny. Like she's a- not your average girl. Uh, then of course we have her book list, everything by any Bronte to kill a mockingbird. Obviously. Not necessarily the most obvious thing, given the, like, white supremacy that is throughout the series, but sure. But then Gone with the Wind is on the list. I, you know. And then, of course, we have the music she listened to, which is the music her mom listened to. So Simon and Garfunkel, Neil Diamond, Joni Mitchell, John Denver. She's not into modern music at all. (laughs) And she says she doesn't watch much TV. I guess her and Edward were like a match made in heaven. And her favorite place to spend time? The library. Like all of us. Let's pander to all the readers. You know, we all like spending time at the library. All right, so page 285 is where we see the blacks for the first time. Um, At this point, Jacob does not know that vampires really exist, but his dad is driving him to visit Bella and freaks out when he realizes that Edward is there. This I thought was interesting. He says, there was something very engaging about Jacob Black's mind, pure and open. It reminded me a bit of Angela's. She's the good friend, only not so demure. I felt suddenly sorry that this particular boy was born my enemy. He was the rare kind of mind that was easy to be inside, restful almost. So clearly we have lots of foreshadowing here. Bella finds him to be restful as well. And you know, He's going to imprint on your daughter. Good luck with that. This is interesting. The assumption, they say, what choice did he have? If we broke the treaty, there was nothing the old men could actually do about it. They'd lost their teeth. So they don't realize that there's going to be new werewolves again. They think they've died out and that's the end of it, um, which is kind of also an interesting precursor. Then we have Esme being a mom. It's very cute. I think there's a lot of this stuff that is really supposed to make you like Edward more, humanize him. Still doesn't make his stalker behavior okay. They realize that they are both each other's first love, which seems highly unlikely, but that's that's how these things go for a book like this. He's right. Is it a warped, unhealthy way for her to begin her romantic life? Probably. One thing that is interesting that we learn earlier in the book is that part of the reason he's so stuck on Bella is that for vampires, apparently, because they're like stone and can't really change, when they do have a big change, it's forever. So like when they fall in love, that's it. And we have more him learning about Bella. What does she want to do? She's interested in going to college in Hawaii, which... I wonder if he remembers that for the honeymoon and that's why he takes her to a tropical location because that definitely seems like something he would probably do. And she was interested in doing something with books, maybe teaching English or working as an editor. If you're looking for more angsty Edward, I told you, you don't see yourself clearly at all. You're not like anyone I've ever known. You fascinate me because he can't hear inside her head, guys. This was interesting. We get a little more insight into Alice's visions and the fact that she can see different paths. And so what's funny is that this path is leading to a point of decision in the meadow where he reveals himself to be a glittery vampire um, or something around that and that there's some kind of a decision that they have to make and face it to figure out what's next. Oh, more foreshadowing, guys. It was nothing that would ever bring her the wrong kind of attention, unless I did something stupid, like go to Italy. Because, you know, it's not like he would ever do something stupid like that. We have him in her bedroom again the night before he's taking her to reveal his glittery vampire self and happy that she used a hairdryer and searched through all her clothes to find something. The pleasure and pain of knowing she wanted to be attractive for me while you're being a creepy stalker. One other thing too, and I, I'm not sure why I didn't tab it, there were I think two instances in this section where he basically talks about being worried that she's going to find him repulsive when he reveals himself, I think because he felt scared and repulsed or something when he saw Carlisle for the first time in the sun after he became a vampire. And I'm like, really? You're worried that being glittery is going to be repulsive? Like, oh, okay? This, this this reminds me a lot of 
Bella thinking that her being pale and thin is really off-putting. This was just part of the story that I said was really interesting where we get some backstory and we find out too how he meets other vampires for the first time and it sets the stage for him choosing to kind of go rogue and actually kill humans. So this part of it was actually super interesting. Um, even as a short story, I would have read this. And then lastly, we will end this section with a little more angsty Edward. The greatest joy of this life. I had no doubts. I now knew the meaning of the phrase. The greatest joy of my life was this fragile, brave, warm, insightful girl sleeping so peacefully nearby. Bella, the very greatest joy that life had to offer me and the greatest pain when she was lost. As he's in her room while she's sleeping. Great. <laughs> All right, moving on to chapter 16. I will check in with you guys in about another 100 pages. 11 p.m. and I have finished the next about 100 pages. I have 200 pages left in the book. Um, so I've read a lot. We're at almost, almost 450 pages read today. Um, I am probably going to pause here for today and finish up the rest of it tomorrow. Yeah, the last 100 pages has also, I think, been better and more interesting. Again, all the stuff that's like backstory on Carlisle and Edward and like the his history of what happened previously, that stuff is much more interesting to me. And I will say that this section of it also gives me a better sense of what Edward and Bella's relationship is actually like. I think that was part of the issue with Twilight for me is I was like, okay, but like what do they actually have between them? And I think you do see a lot more of it in this book. So in some ways, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be, but it's still way too long. And parts of it are quite boring because you do know like what's going to happen. So it's interesting. Like I, I actually think that parts of this are pretty good and pretty interesting, but this book probably should have been like, half the length that it is, at least in my opinion. Okay, so with that said, um, let me share my taps. All right, so the day is here. Edward is taking Bella to the clearing to show her how he's super glittery. And this I just thought was funny. They accidentally end up matching, like wearing the same thing. And it's, it's especially weird because it's a white, button down sleeveless top with jeans and a light tan sweater, which is number one, super boring. Like you went through your whole closet the night before and this is what you decided is the thing to wear. Okay. But also it's just kind of funny that they ended up matching. As always, we've got angsty Edward. She was always too kind. She gave me credit. I didn't deserve worried over my feelings as if they mattered. Her very goodness was what put her in this danger. Her virtue, my vice, the two opposites, binding us together. We've joked, especially in live shows, about Edward being a prude. Here is a perfect example of it. He takes off his sweater, so he still has a button-up shirt on it, but his arms are uncovered, and he feels glaringly conspicuous <laughs> because of being so uncovered. I just, it's, I'm like, dude, you're you're uncovering your arms. Apparently we're into like bare arms and collarbones in this book. And yet another reference to Hades and Persephone. There was another one that I didn't tab. Um, she is going hard for this reference in this book. She walked almost reverently into the golden light. It gilded her hair and made her fair skin glow. Her fingers trailed over the taller flowers and I was reminded again of Persephone springtime personified. You're going to see it again. I mean, there is like reference after reference to Hades and Persephone and the pomegranate. And uh, yeah, like we're, we're, we're going hard with the theme. So we've kind of gone through this whole thing where she, of course, thinks that his glittery self is beautiful and not terrifying. And he's so relieved. Why he thought she was going to think it was terrifying, I don't know. So now they're talking. They're playing with like physical touch. She touches his arm and he's obviously super into it. You can't imagine how that feels. I couldn't have imagined it before this moment. It was beyond any pleasure I'd ever felt. 
<laughs> her fingers traced back up to the inside of my elbow. Like, wow, the greatest pleasure you have ever felt. <laughs> so this is interesting. This is Edward coming back to Carlisle and Esme after his time spent killing humans, even though there were, you know, murderous ones. And what's interesting about it is the way that it reads is very, very similar to the biblical story of the prodigal son. You know, it kind of goes with this whole thing of Carlisle sometimes taking this godlike figure. But again, he comes back. He's scared of what they're going to say. And Carlisle stared back in my face with only happiness in his mind. Though he had to know what the color of my eyes meant, there was no off note to his delight. There's nothing to apologize for. And here we go again. Hades and Persephone, I told you, this was a dangerous path to even hint at. Hades and his pomegranate. How many toxic seeds had I already infected her with? Enough that Alice had seen her pale and grieving in my absence. So we have this whole long, drawn-out scene where he basically tries to resist her scent and gets better at it. And then, like, I don't know if they've kissed yet at this point, but they kiss and, you know, he's like, finally, I can resist it. I've decided now. Okay, so here it is. This is this is how he overcomes it, is he basically plays the whole sequence of events through in his head, which he had been avoiding thinking about, of what it would be like to drain her of her blood and kill her, basically. And he says, I played the sequence of events through to the end, surprised even as I let these taboo imaginings loose at how little they appeal to me now. Um, I felt no desire to act on my imaginings. So this is a big turning point for Edward where he realizes that even though he has this physical and instinctive desire for her, he loves her too much to actually want to act on it. Um, so th this is interesting, and I think this is a lot of what Alice was talking about in terms of a decision being made and a turning point where he finally decides no. Uh, and he says it's mind over matter. And this is interesting, too. We have multiple times, like here, talking about how neither of them had ever, and I think there's another place I tabbed somewhere, neither of them had ever loved or lusted for anybody previously. And, you know, I don't know that this is Stephanie Meyer's goal or that she would ever say it on the page, but the way that it reads, especially here, makes me think of somebody who's demisexual. And, you know, that could be interesting if you could actually say that, like, Edward and Bella are demisexual and on the asexual spectrum. It would make things make a lot more sense in terms of why it had to be this one person before either of them actually experienced those feelings. So that's an interesting way to look at it. I kind of would be curious to see what Stephanie Meyer would actually think about that. All right, let's get some Edward melodrama when they finally kiss. <laughs> it's so over the top. What strange alchemy was this? that the touch of lips should be so much more than the touch of fingers. It made no logical sense that simple contact between this specific area of skin should be so much more powerful than anything I'd yet experienced. It felt as if a new sun was bursting into being where our mouths met, and my whole body was filled to a shatter point with the brilliant light of it. What's funny is, I think this is probably both of their first real kisses. My first kiss was not like that. <laughs> but, okay. This I thought was interesting is it sounds like with Rosalie, it, again, and related to what I was saying about like this demisexual thing previously, he says the extent of my aversion would be impolite to share, ungentlemanly, but she was never more than a sister. That was probably the kindest way to sum up that chapter. That he was, like, actively not interested in Rosalie, despite her being objectively really beautiful. So, yeah, I am going to posit that Edward is somewhere on the asexual spectrum. I feel like that makes the most sense, given all of this. So then we finally have him admitting, in kind of a half-joking manner initially, 
that he has been in her room every night, basically watching her sleep. And what's ridiculous is that Bella is not concerned about the invasion of her privacy, not concerned about the creepiness of the stalkerish behavior. No, her biggest concern is what he heard her say when she talked in her sleep. We have him hearing Charlie asking her about if any of the boys, she was in any of the boys in town. And this seems to start this thing of him saying, was he worried she wasn't having a normal teen experience, that she was missing out? For a second, I felt a deep twinge of doubt. Should I be worried about the same? What was I keeping her from? And I wonder if this is the seed of him doing all the things to try to make sure she has as normal of an experience as possible. And then, of course, we get the jealousy again. Like, dude, why are you? What? 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 No. All this jealousy of Mike Newton, especially after all this. I just I hate I hate it. No. And this, I think, is some of what I was saying earlier. I didn't believe I would ever find someone I wanted to be with in another way than my brothers and sisters. Perhaps romance always seemed a slightly foolish thing to everyone until one actually fell into it. And then to find, even though it's all new to me, that I'm good at it, at being with you. I don't think this is typical, especially for someone who's lived so long. And so I, I'm, I think the demisexual thing makes sense. Oh my gosh. I remember a line like this from the last series, and I still think it's ridiculous. Just because I'm resisting the wine doesn't mean I can't appreciate the bouquet. You have a very floral smell. <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, I hate this comparison. And as I said, this is it. She says, I've never felt like this about anyone before, not even close. I know, it's just that I know other people's thoughts. I know love and lust don't always keep the same company. And she says, they do for me, now anyway that they exist for me at all. So, yeah, I mean... Does this not sound like being demisexual? This is exactly what this sounds like. And for some more foreshadowing, we have Charlie. He left an hour ago. After reattaching your battery cables, I might add, I have to admit I was disappointed. Is that really all it would take to stop you if you were determined to go? I'm pretty sure he uses this trick later to keep her from going to the reservation. So foreshadowing, guys. Lots of foreshadowing in this book. Okay, so this is where I'm at. I have about 200 pages left to read tomorrow. I'm going to stop there for the night. I am happy with how much reading I got done. Uh, this was the main thing that I did today, but I should be able to pretty easily finish this tomorrow. So check in with you guys tomorrow. Good morning. Good morning. It's Sunday. What are you doing? You're drawing? Yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> no, Mama, let do tea. Tea. It's not a picture, it's a video. Oh. Oh. It, good morning. Happy Sunday. Okay. I'm going to start reading Bye. Midnight Sun. Got 200 pages left. Bye. So I started inputting my footage and cutting out like blank spaces. We're already over an hour. I'm gonna have to get this down. Okay, so I have just over a hundred pages left in the book. This part was fine. It felt a lot like rehashing things that happened previously in Twilight. I, yeah, I don't feel like we get that much new information, but I do have a few tabs to talk about and we do get more of Edward's sort of like controlling behavior and you know again it's being framed as him trying to protect Bella but I, I think it often takes over in ways that are not healthy um, so we will go through my tabs one thing that I think is interesting about this book is that Edward's perspective of Bella is is so different from her internal perspective. And I think like some of the things, so I, th I think maybe what the author is trying to do here is the fact that Bella is so insecure, so insecure, doesn't really come through or at least doesn't penetrate Edward's understanding. Like he can't wrap his head around it. And so I, I think the idea is supposed to be that the choices he makes are because he doesn't think she's insecure because like, why would she be? Which, yeah, I think 
a lot of what this comes down to is not only do they sort of have a toxic relationship, they do not communicate well with each other at all. Because you would never know that Edward had the level of anxiety he has from Bella's perspective, and he clearly has no idea that she is as insecure as she is. Okay, so let's go through the few tabs that I have, and then we will finish up this book. <laughs> So we get a little bit more on Edward and Carlisle's history in chapter 20. This was actually pretty disturbing. Edward like stalks this guy for a long time who's considering assaulting and then murdering a very young child who's like a five-year-old. And then the night that the guy goes in to try to do that, Edward ends up killing him. This is just kind of disturbing to read and feels unnecessary. Like, I, I don't understand why we have this of like a child predator who's never done it before. I, yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of gross. We see Jacob and Billy show up again and Bella gets annoyed when he uses the word child for Jacob when she, cause she's like, Jacob is not that much younger than I am. You know, they're not on the page that much and the way this is done stays away from the, the, the issues that are big problems in the earlier parts of the series. But I think mostly just because they're not on the page that much other than Billy being concerned about having the vampires in town. But we don't, because Edward doesn't go to La Push, we don't see the rest of the native population. This is a flashback to when they first let Billy know that the Cullens were going to be going back and his concern, because one of the things that can break the treaty is if any of the native people go within five miles of the residence of the Cullens, and he's concerned how would they convince the children to obey the rule the kids are pretty young at this point and so you can definitely see the concern and the anxiety that would come from their side of things with having the cullens in, in town you would think well but they only drink animal blood it's fine but when you're worried about your children and you know that this mythical creature actually exists that's a concern. Edward is introduced to Charlie for the first time as her boyfriend. Charlie has very mixed feelings about it, but he does find it entertaining that Bella might watch a baseball game. So it's not all bad at this point. This is a section on page 481 that I found to be kind of disturbing. And I think another great example of Edward being manipulative. Bella is not sure that she wants to have him run with her through the forest to go to the baseball game. And in order to convince her, he decides to manipulate her by kissing her. And this is intentional he knows that that's the effect it will have and it's just kind of disturbing he keeps asking questions like he'll kiss her and then be like are you sure i wouldn't let anything harm you right and then kisses her again it, like the manipulativeness of this of trying to get the response he wants is just kind of gross and this is when they do kiss and he pulls back and freaks out and is like killing her would surely kill me too her life was my only life my fragile finite life they have such this codependent enmeshed relationship and you can really see this from edward's side here oh and here we go again i infuriate myself the way i can't seem to keep from putting you in danger my very existence puts you at risk sometimes i truly hate myself i should be stronger I should be able to. And she's just like, don't. It's fine. But like, this is coming after him snapping at her and being a jerk. He recognizes the problems with his behavior, but doesn't do anything to change them. And Bella just kind of excuses it. So they have the baseball game and we get Laurent and James and Victoria showing up. And so here's the first introduction. They think Laurent is the leader at the beginning, even though really we know he's not. And he thinks Rosalie's hot, so he's wondering if she's mated. And this is the beginning of seeing James. James doesn't want to be careful. He's anxious for a fight. And Edward being able to hear inside his head is definitely even more disturbing. I mean, he's already creepy, but we can see how into the idea of being able to track and hunt and kill vampires and humans is for him. It's like a game. And again, we have Edward leaping ahead. He's freaking out. He's trying to protect Bella and is making decisions without talking to her, with without explaining any, anything to her. And she's like, no, you can't do this. And he just kind of keeps going. And Alice is the one who steps in is like, hey, pull over. We need to talk to her. You can't just do this. And he has Emma immobilize her wrist so that she can't move. You know, it's just it's it continues to not be healthy. And he's doing it supposedly for her protection. But it, it it's still not OK. It's a repeated pattern of behavior. 
But here we go. Alice is the voice of reason. Let's just look at our options for a minute. For him, there is no other option. This is interesting because we do see how many different futures Alice is seeing and how they're quickly responding to that and why they maybe didn't take the time to explain it to Bella, but they needed to. And Alice can see that, but he can't. He's like so blinded by anger and fear and anxiety. And it's like, well, maybe you should get some help for that and not cause problems with your human girlfriend. So this is interesting too. We hear a little bit more inside Laurent's head when he decides to go visit the vampires up in Alaska and he thinks that they're weak. He sees the domesticity as a deficiency and, um, you know, but is also curious. And then lastly, I just thought this was interesting when they divide up to try to confuse James. He apparently has some of Bella's socks with her scent in his pocket so that James is more likely to follow them. OK, so a uh, little over 100 pages left to go. I'm going to go ahead and finish this up and then I will be back with my overall thoughts. So we are done. It's like 1:30 Sunday afternoon. I finished it in the weekend. I can get started on editing this vlog once I'm done. Um, how did I feel about this? We're going to go through my tabs and then I'll give you guys kind of an overview. But in general, this was a bit of a struggle for me to get through, <laughs> to be honest. Like there were some parts that were interesting and better than what I had expected. But in, but overall, it, it's so long. OK. All right. Let's just let's let's look at the tabs. First up, we have Edward 554 being angsty. I know, Bella, believe me, I know. It's like you've taken half myself away with you. Basically, what's happened here is they did this whole long chase thing trying to catch James and he gets away. Now they've flown to Arizona because they know he's going to try to kill Bella. So here they are. And now we get this very long car chase scene, uh, which I have. I imagine the author probably had fun writing. It was fine. I think if you like car chase scenes, you will probably enjoy this. They basically steal very fast, very expensive cars. How they found them in Arizona? I don't know, but somehow they did. And then they do all of these wild antics to try to get there before Bella is killed. So they get there and Bella has been bitten, as we know. And the question is, should Edward bite her again and help her be a vampire or does he do what he ends up doing which is suck out the venom which i still have questions about that because every time he even smells bella's blood venom comes out in his mouth so how exactly did he bite her without putting more venom in her system i'm realizing that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense but he is absolutely refusing to go along with alice's idea of just letting her become a vampire he's like no she would suffer i i can't i can't deal with it and she'll be like what if she's like rosalie and she regrets it so instead he sucks out the venom and this is him talking about the bliss of her blood and how it erased every burn he'd ever suffered and was more than the ab absence of pain and yet he's able to stop somehow this was kind of interesting because Bella is so out of it after getting hurt that we never really get to see what happens while she's in the hospital and on the way to the hospital. And so it is kind of fun to see Alice figure out all the possibilities of how to slip into the hospital, steal blood to make it look like she really did fall through that window. And it is pretty ridiculous that her parents just like easily accepted that she somehow fell through a plated glass window and tripped and fell down the stairs and got hurt that badly. Like something seems very wrong with that. <laughs> this is Alice actually making the broken glass and recreating the crime scene. This was kind of fun to read of like what they actually did to make it look like that's what happened. Renee shows up. She meets Edward for the first time. This was kind of interesting. We find out that Renee's mental voice is also really unusual. And so we see a little bit about how the combination of her and Charlie somehow led to Bella's differences. So that was just kind of an interesting little bit. Yeah, here it is. I just said to the nurse, Bella fell down some stairs. It's not that unusual. It was amazing how easily both of her parents accepted the story. The window was unfortunate. Like, it's just wild that she's that clumsy, that this is a expected problem. And again, we've got references to Hades and Persephone. 
Pomegranate seeds and my underworld. Hadn't I just witnessed a brutal example of how badly my world could go wrong for her? And she was lying here broken because of it. I wonder if anybody has done a count of how many references to Hades, Persephone, and pomegranate seeds are in this book because there's gotta be like 20 of them. He watches the video that James took of what he did to Bella and it's horrifying. And then we learn a little bit about Alice and where she came from, that James actually killed the vampire who created her and she had grown up in an asylum, which I think we knew kind of from the other books. And we have Angsty Edward. None of that seemed relevant now because it was my fault, everything she had suffered. Clearly he blames himself for everything and that is going to lead into some choices. This is him meeting Renee, uh, Bella's mom, and she's really uncomfortable with him and worried about how young she is and how in love they seem to be, and with really good reason. <laughs> to be honest. But of course, when he suggests that she live somewhere else where he can't hurt her anymore, she freaks out, starts hyperventilating. Again, this is a look at what we're going to get more of in New Moon when he does actually leave. Then we have this whole thing of Edward and Alice plotting to take Bella to prom, even though she doesn't want to go. And I kind of hate this whole thing. So he imagines that she'll be happy in the end and thinks he knows what's best for her imagines what she'll say when her kids ask her years in the future and says, it was crazy. I didn't really want to go, you know, I'm no dancer, but my lunatic best friend kidnapped me for a makeover and my boyfriend took me over my protests. It wasn't so bad in the end. I'm glad I went. So this is him imagining how she's going to feel about it. So instead of finding out how she actually feels about it and trusting her to know what she really wants, he thinks that he knows best. And I, you know, it's just, it's not really okay. Again, here we got the jealousy, we get the overprotectiveness. This is when Tyler thinks he's taking her to prom. And like he, he recognizes that his response is stronger than it should be. Bella's pissed off about it. And like he sees it, but doesn't do anything to change it over and over and over again. And this honestly is disturbing to me. He locks the car doors when Bella freaks out about the fact that he's taking her to prom and then says, don't be difficult, Bella. Like he's literally forcing her to go somewhere that she doesn't want to go. It's not cute. This part was interesting. Jacob shows up at the dance um, because his dad wants him to warn her. So he doesn't yet know about the werewolves, but clearly changes are already happening to him because he says there's an, it's an awful perfume Bella's wearing. He's obviously starting to smell the vampires that he doesn't like, um, but doesn't know what it is yet, which is kind of interesting. So there you have it, folks. Midnight Sun, general feelings. Edward is hella angsty, and Edward is still overly controlling, manipulative, and stalkerish, and just because he realizes that does not make it okay. Um, being in his head did not make me like him any more than I liked him in the other books. Bella seems more likable from being in his head, but I think it's only because he can't hear her thoughts, because she's really also petty and insecure, just like every other human girl that he gets annoyed with listening to their thoughts about. So yeah, do I come away from this feeling like, yes, this was definitely the love story that was supposed to be? No. <laughs> no, I don't. I still don't like Edward. Um, the book is way too long. I feel like this should have been half the length. Maybe if it was 300 pages long, she could just leave in some of the most interesting pieces, but it's way too long. Parts of it are so boring and overwritten. There are some interesting bits of it, like little short stories where we get snippets of the history of different characters. That was kind of cool. And some of the parts of seeing a different perspective was interesting, but it was just too much. So yeah, overall, probably I was enjoying the process of vlogging about the book more than I actually enjoyed reading the book, which is not great. Star rating, it's, I don't know, it's like one and a half or two stars. I'll probably write a review and edit this video and make some kind of a decision how I feel about it, but it's it's not great. So I think if you were a super fan of the series and you really just want to see everything from Edward's perspective, maybe you will enjoy this more than I did. There are some parts of it that are interesting. But it, at least for me, did not do anything to redeem Edward. <laughs> yeah. Also, man, she was so heavy handed with the Hades and Persephone stuff. The writing is a little bit better than the original books, but it's still not good. Mostly. That's it. That is that is Midnight Sun. 
Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings. Have you read the book? What did you think of it? Um, yeah, I'm come join us for the live show on Friday. <laughs> It's gonna be an interesting one. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.